בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We are back here on our Wednesday night, stop the rabbi, we're after some דברי תורה. You guys, בעזרת השם, will ask some questions. הקדוש ברוך הוא, בעזרת השם, will give us the answers. And we'll get closer and closer to הקדוש ברוך הוא. Tonight's שיעור is certainly going to be one that's going to shake up some people, especially those that are still on the uh, fence of whether to uh, do tshuva or not do tshuva, to convert to Judaism or not to convert to Judaism. This is all intended for all of you. And certainly for those people that are already religious but are one foot in the secular world and one foot in the uh, religious world. Because uh, uh, this parasha is parashat matan Torah and it speaks about everything we just mentioned. Tonight's show is going to be for the Refua Shlema, for uh, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, Rav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara, Avi Mori David Ben Nesriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, Sara Bat Levana, and all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahides that continue to support our organization and help us reach more and more people to get them to do tshuva, get them to closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu Bezad Hashem. And of course, uh, all of those wonderful people that want to convert to Judaism genuinely, uh, this is certainly going to be one that's going to help uh, many of them at least make the decision uh, of what they need to do. Now, uh, just as a uh, update, some service, you know, public service announcements. Uh, first and foremost, uh, for those of you that have not ordered the free books that we have on our, in our Kiruv store, I have no idea what you're waiting for. Uh, literally, you have a easy cheap to the extent of free opportunity to help people do tshuva and get them to Olam Abba and get yourself there as well uh, by simply going to the Kiruv store, kiruvstore.org, get yourself some of this new book that we have that's both in English and Hebrew. Uh, if you have a Hebrew-speaking community, uh, then this book is the best of the best. It has all of the uh, necessary pieces for a person to get a clear idea of uh, how to serve a Kadosh Baruch Hu when it comes to rebuke, when it comes to reward and punishment, when it comes to converts, when it comes to business. And also, where was God during the Holocaust? These couple of books and a few other things as far as, far as the uh, uh, Kiruv store are perfect tools to help Am Yisrael do tshuva. Uh, if you haven't ordered it already, like I said, it's free. So uh, it's just mind-boggling to me that there's still books left in our warehouse, even though Baruch Hashem... We had a huge amount of uh, inventory leave, probably uh, almost half of it left in the last uh, few days, but still, I think even that is too much. Uh, so that's one. Get yourself some of this stuff. Be'ez Hashem, you'll help your community. Second thing, many of you have been asking me for months now about tefillin because we've had a back order. There's been a shortage of tefillin in the market, especially high-quality tefillin, Baruch Hashem. Uh, we got our order of tefillin, both uh, uh, Rashi and Rabenu Tam, and we have even some Ashkenazim that all arrived. We don't have many of any of them, uh, but uh, we have a few. For, you know, usually when we get them in, you know, it's first come, first serve. Uh, you can go on the website and order them. They, of course, all come in a you know beautiful packaging with some Bezrat Hashem. Propaganda on the back to remind you where you got them, but uh, the tefillin are beautiful. Some of them come also with the uh, um, silver or uh, gold casing. Bottom line is they're the best of the best. I don't know of anybody else that sells these, uh, this high quality level of tefillin in the United States at least. Uh, but uh, Baruch Hashem, we got them. They're in. Anyone that wants it, of course, if your tefillin are still from the bar mitzvah, uh, then, and you're in your 20s, 30s, or 40s, there's something wrong with you. Uh, same thing goes for those people that are married and uh, have already been in the uh, tshuva world and uh, have been from already for at least three, four, five years. What are you waiting for? Rabenu Tam is, uh, is certainly a necessary uh, tool for your everyday prayer. Rav Vadya Allah Shalom was very particular about making sure that every Jew puts on a, not only the Rashi Tfilin, but also the Rabbeinu Tam, uh, if they're married. Uh, and uh, for those of you that don't have it, not really sure why, but uh, this is certainly something you need to have. Uh, but of course, Tfilin, just like Mezuzot, as we've talked, spoken about in the past, is not something that you buy uh, you know, from just anybody. If you don't know who wrote them, who's responsible for them, 
who's vouching for them, uh, then you don't buy them, no matter what the price is. Whether it's free or it's a million dollars, you simply just don't do it. It's just the same thing of how you should not do that with a Sefer Torah. Uh, just the same thing like you wouldn't do it with a wife or a husband. If you don't have anybody that's going to vouch for, uh, for, for them, then uh, you know, how do you know they're not going to go crazy on you? So these are some of the things that people have to consider, but uh, Baruch Hashem, we did all of the work for you, and Baruch Hashem, we've never had uh, anybody uh, have an issue with the tefillin. They've all uh, been more than happy when they got them. Uh, and even the one time we had a uh, someone that was uh, uh, somewhat shaky about it nearly two and a half years later, uh, when we, you know, we sent him a uh, replacement, but he actually said, you know what, I, I <laughs> my, uh, my, uh, uh, my concerns were just the Yetzirah, I don't need a new one, and he sent them back. Uh, so, point being is that uh, when you deal with high-level, high-quality uh, tefillin, mezuzot, uh, pretty much uh, you don't have to worry about uh, any issues. Uh, now, as far as the prices, the prices as of now stayed the same, uh, but already the vendors have already told me, meaning the Sufrim, the Tzadikim have told me that the price of everything has gone up drastically, meaning by 40 to 60 percent, unless the prices change uh, in uh, the uh, next six months or so, uh, uh, most likely we're going to have to adjust as well. But at least for now, everything is as is. But the price increase has re been ridiculous. Uh, but we're trying to do whatever we can. So, with that being said, we have, Baruch Hashem, an extraordinary parasha, as we talked about it yesterday. Anyone that hasn't watched the lecture from yesterday, you should simply stop your life tomorrow and go watch the lecture from yesterday. Why? Because as a part of it that's regarding this week's parasha about Mount Sinai, what actually transpired over there, that is certainly uh, not just an inspiration, but also a clarification and an enlightenment for anyone that watches it who does not really know what really transpired over there. So watch that lecture yes, uh, uh, from yesterday. That's part of the um, Jewish Intimacy series. But needless to say, the Torah always connects to everything. So, of course, what if we already talked about you know this week's parasha yesterday, what are we going to talk about today? The same exact thing, but just new things. Why? Because the Torah is endless. Endless, but uh, as we've done at times during our teachings as well as during our studying, sometimes the best way to get to the point is by actually starting at the end and then working ourselves backwards. So, of course, we see the last couple of psukim in the parasha, parasha titro, the parasha where we are introduced to several different things. Uh, we're introduced to itro the ultimate convert. We're also introduced to the legal system that's still being implemented until this day, not only in the Jewish world, but in, even in the secular world where it's the different levels of court system. But we're also introduced to the Ten Commandments. We're introduced to the strictness of the law. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us an example of this for anyone that hasn't read the parasha and just simply wants a little tidbit of how critical morality is to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we see even that Bet HaMikdash of the desert that we had, needless to say the Bet HaMikdash that was in Jerusalem, uh, the first one for 410 years, the second one for 420 years, even those had the same exact thing, which is the consideration of morality. What consideration? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that the, uh, the uh, ramp to go up to the Mizbeach has to be a ramp rather than stairs. Why? You shall not ascend my Mizbech on steps, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so that your nakedness will not be unco uncovered upon it. Meaning, so that the ground does not see the nakedness of the Kohen going up to the Mizbech. Obviously, we're not going to go into the details of all of this. It's self-explanatory, but more than anything else, it shows us how HaKadosh Baruch Hu is particular about everything. For all of those heretics that have decided to start YouTube channels uh, talking about their life, talking about their abandonment of God,
talking about their so-called belief in God, but not actually doing what he says. Apparently, there's a bunch of Jewish people that have decided that they're going to put their day job aside and become YouTubers. And they all started some type of podcast because they think they're going to be the next Joe Rogan and make millions. Little do they know, it'd be surprising if they could even pay their rent from their nonsense. But the point is, is that many of them are either themselves or they're bringing guests that are so-called religious or used to be religious Jews that are just spewing spiritual vomit by desecrating God's name on a regular basis, just letting people know how much they dislike this, they disagree with this, uh, you know, and, and unfortunately, you know, people send me this stuff, I get to see some of this uh, uh, nonsense uh, because it just gives me an idea of where we stand, but unfortunately, it's something that has become a lot more popular over the uh, you know last couple of years. And uh, for those people that say, well, I don't really think that God really cares about whether I uh, eat milk and meat together or whether I uh, turn on the electricity on Shabbat or whether my wife has uh, the, uh, you know, a blood stain on the, uh, on the bedika cloth or not and all types of other things that they just simply don't think that God cares about these so-called small things. Well, my dear friend, my dear brother and sister, apparently a Kadosh Baruch who cares enough about morality, about his law, about his Torah, to such an extent that even the way to get to the Mizbeach, that has nothing but ground under it, also has to be modest. So needless to say, your wife has to be modest, you have to be modest, everybody has to be modest, and if... A person knows enough Torah, they know that there is uh, certainly an answer for every single question. If you still have a question, that means you haven't asked the right people or you simply did not ask anybody. You just left it in your head because you're trying to justify your heresy. Now, Rabotai Yikarim, we have a holy Torah that tells us at the end of it, how important morality is, how important modesty is, both for men and for women. And of course, we have the Ten Commandments. Now, in the Ten Commandments, we have some of the most important statements that are relevant to all of the people that I spoke about already today, whether it be the people that are on the fence or the people that have broken the fence, and quite frankly, to everybody, people that ask questions and, and say, listen, are you sure that uh, once Mashiach comes, there's no more tshuva? Are you sure that a mechalel Shabbat is worse than a murderer? Are you sure that Gehenim could be for eternity? Are you sure about the things you say? Isn't God the God of love? Well, according to the Christians, they say that, but at the same token, they teach about Gehenim themselves because they have plagiarized our parts of our Torah. Either way, everything that I say, I am 100% sure. Not because I am such a genius, but simply because it's written in endless amount of sources without debate. Now, one of the things that's critically uh, important for people to understand is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has an extraordinary amount of mercy in this world. Once a person finishes their judgment in this world, their, their life in this world, when the time of judgment comes, there's no mercy. There's just judgment. There's just judgment. And when a person wants to know whether God loves him or God hates him, he should also ask himself whether he is considered a lover of God himself or a hater of God. How would one know? Simple. Let's see what God has to say about it. In the Ten Commandments, chapter 20, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us clearly who are his enemies, who are his friends, who are his lovers, who are these people. Chapter 20, verse number 5. HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us because we are simply need to uh, make up a lot of uh, uh, time here, we have to go a little quickly. I'm not going to read it in Hebrew. I'm just going to go straight to the English. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, For I am Hashem your God, a zealous God, who assesses the sins of fathers to met out 
retribution upon their similarly rebellious children, upon the third generation and even upon the fourth generation, for my enemies. That is, when the sons continue to sin after their fathers. But who does kindness for thousands of generations to those who love me and those who observe my commandments? Here we see, Rabotai Ekerim, several different things. Number one, we see that the sin of the father can actually cause the children major harm if they continue the sins. If the father was a Mechalel Shabbat, if the father was a heretic, if the father was an Apikolos, if the father was a thief, and the son or daughter continues, they'll get punished severely. On the other hand, if they don't continue, they won't get punished for what their fathers did. And in fact, we'll find out later on today, they could actually even help their wicked father. Secondly, we learn, there are people that HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself calls my enemies. Who are those my enemies? Those people that go against God. Those people that do not observe Shabbat, those people that do not observe Kashrut, those people that are thieves, pedophiles, rapists, horrible people, not just in the aspect of society, you know, between one person and another, but also between them and God. If God said, do not lie and you lie, God said, do not steal and you steal. God says, be modest and you're not modest. God said, keep Shabbat, you don't keep Shabbat. God said, study Torah and you don't study Torah. God said, don't desecrate my name, and you desecrate his name. Don't worship an idol. You worship idols. Any of these things that you make your life, you're in essence putting yourself in the caliber of being one of God's enemies. If there's the occasional sin, and then you do tshuva, you're an extraordinary, amazing, beautiful person. Why? Because the Gemara, in Masechet Sanhedrin, and in countless other places says, that people that do tshuva are even better than people that haven't sinned. Why? He saw the taste of sin. He tasted the taste of sin and still returned to me. He's amazing. On the other hand, a person that lives a sinful life, completely disregards the Torah, whether he has a hat and a beard or not, is irrelevant. Bottom line is, you live a sinful life, you're considered an enemy of God. Like this one character, that was uh, shown to me on a video just literally a day or two days ago. He claims to be an avrich here in America. If he is the avrichim, he should shut down all of the kolos and all the yeshivot. Why? He's reading. He's reading a gemara. He's reading a Talmud, smoking a cigarette, which is not a problem, but cursing, using foul, disgusting language in order to justify his point. Such a person, the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says, even if he had blessings decreed upon him for 70 years, meaning his whole life, just for those curses, he lost all of them. Now the point is, Rabotai, the reason why this is what it is, is because God made the law, not me. If it was up to me, why would I care what you do? You don't affect me. But in the, in the world of God, we all affect each other. Kol Yisrael HaRavim Zelazeh. A Jew that makes a sin in America could affect a Jew that is living in France, that is living in England. A Jew that's making a sin in England could affect a Jew that's in Israel. A Jew that's in Israel that's making a sin over there could affect the Jews all over the world. The point being is, according to God's system, we're all connected whether we like it or not. So when a Kadosh Baruch Hu says he has enemies, he is talking about people that are causing harm to his children, even though they themselves are his children. On the other hand, number three, we learned there are people that HaKadosh Baruch Hu calls his lovers. Who are his lovers? He's very clear about it. Those who love me and those who observe my commandments. Meaning, if you want to know whether HaKadosh Baruch Hu considers you an enemy or a lover, simple. Are you observing the Torah or not? Now you say, no, I'm observing it according to my understanding. Your understanding, Habibi, is worth zero. Literally, zero. If there was a way to make zero a negative, we would do that too. Why? Because we have a Shulchan Aruch. We have a Masoret. We have a tradition. 
And one of the main things that we learn from that very same tradition is that even if you are a gaon, a genius, someone beyond our imagination, let's just imagine for a moment that you are like the Rogachover gaon, one of the greatest Chabadniks that ever lived. He was such a gaon, literally, if you did not know how to learn Torah at the highest level, you wouldn't be able to understand his speech. He wrote literally tens of thousands of tshuvot for halacha. But a Rav Avadya writes in Yabiya Omer, Chachamim do not paskin like the Roga Tshuva Gaon. Why? He was a genius. Everyone agrees he's a genius. Everyone agrees Talmit Chacham beyond our comprehension. But we don't paskin halacha like him. Why? Because his way of paskining halacha did not go based on the tradition that was accepted among all of the Chachamim for the last 500 years. And all the Chachamim over the last 800 years. And all the Chachamim over the last 2,000 years. Why did he do it? Because the way that he wrote, literally, was simply Gemara, Rambam, bottom line. But the way that the tradition is is that we have to not just use Gemara, Rambam, we also have to see what the other Puskim are doing, what are the Rishonim doing, the Geonim are doing, all of the different geniuses that have discussed this. How do we, we can't just say this is what it is. We have to know what is the tradition, who else spoke about this. We have to consider everything, even if one is following the Halacha and there is a different opinion by one of the Chachamim, that you can do it in a different way, there's a special mitzvah of honoring the Torah by honoring the Chachamim, by also doing, if possible, something that will also be in agreement with the other Chachamim. Meaning, the more Chachamim you're in agreement with, the better you're doing as a Jew, the more of a lover of the Torah you are, the more of a lover of Hashem you are. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us exactly here, if you are religious according to your own opinion, you've modernized the Torah, you have minimized the Torah, you have deformed and reformed the Torah, you are considered an enemy of God. Now one that is an enemy of God, they should know you're putting yourself in the same caliber as someone that is using a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name in vain. You are in essence putting a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name in the same respect as you are putting your own honor. And in that particular case, when it comes to most sins, the Gemara in Masechet Shavuot, page 39a says, if a sinner repents, if a sinner does tshuva, a Kadosh Baruch Hu will forgive him without him having to suffer. But if a sinner if a sinner swears, meaning they use a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name falsely, Megaleh Panim Torah, even if he does tshuva, a Kadosh Baruch Hu will still have to give him suffering. That's how bad it is. Now, that's assuming the person did tshuva. But the point being here is, we have an understanding that your father, if he's righteous, good for you. If he's wicked, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be wicked also. If you are wicked and he was wicked, you're going to have double punishment. You have a very serious problem. Second, enemy of God, lover of God. We have a clear understanding of that too. We got to keep going. Now when it says that the fathers that are wicked, the fathers that are righteous, it affects the sons in a certain way. What about, what about if the father is a goy, father is not Jewish, and the son or the daughter converted, what about them? Rav Yitzchak Yosef in Yalkut Yosef Ilchot Kaddish in Siman fifty six he writes that a convert that his biological father or mother have passed away, even though they're spiritually no longer connected to him. He could still say Kaddish for them. Now, this is not just for the sake of you know, making them go from Gehenom to, to heaven. This is not the only purpose of Kaddish. This is even for righteous people. As the Arizal teaches, where even if you say Kaddish for a righteous person, 
it's still good for them. Why? Because Kaddish is not just for the sake of relieving them from the judgment during that first year after they die, but also even if they're actually in heaven, you saying Kaddish on them can elevate them to even higher levels in heaven itself. So the point is, is that when a person says Kaddish, learns the laws of Kaddish, the intricate details of Kaddish, they'll know that there's a lot to it. There's a lot of value to it. In fact, even if somebody was a, uh, you know, a Jew that was uh, adopted, a Jew that was adopted by two Jewish parents and they have passed away, there actually is an obligation for them to honor those parents just like they would have to honor their biological parents. And when those parents pass away, they also have to say Kaddish. They also have to say Kaddish. This is part of the mitzvah of Kibbut Avaim. Sometimes you see people that have been adopted have uh, fantastic gratitude to their, uh, to their adoptive parents, and sometimes you see literally the exact opposite, ungratefulness to the highest extent. Unfortunately, I've witnessed this one time, and really I wanted to vomit uh, with this uh, particular situation, but you can't fix people. You could just simply teach, and people will choose whether they want to use that as a cure or not. Now, of course, this is under the conditions where those... Uh, you know, parents uh, that adopted the child are normal, are reasonable, have done their best to, to raise this child and not people that uh, are abusive and, and, and so on. Now, furthermore, we have a, uh, also something that's very important to know in regards to saying Kaddish for the parents, that there is a tradition that uh, some Ashkenazim follow, which is to only say Kaddish during the first 11 months after their parents die, uh, because it said that the, uh, the judgment you know, for the wicked is 12 months, uh, and many people misunderstand this, what this actually means. We spoke about this extensively in the Gehenom film, but either way, the uh, Sephardi Jews do not do this. Sephardi Jews actually say Kaddish for 12 months after 11 months, they have a shiul Torah in the honor of their parent that have that died, but then they uh, they stop for a week and then they continue. In essence, you don't want to imply that your parents uh, were uh, one of the, among the wicked that have to be judged for twelve months. Now, either way, the uh, for those that uh, still keep on the tradition of only eleven months, they should know that the zoal in. Uh, uh, in Parashat Shmot, page 16b, teaches that if it wasn't for the prayers of the deceased, meaning the people that have passed on, on behalf of those that are living in this world, the world would not continue to exist for even a fraction of the day. Meaning that when you say Kaddish for your loved ones that have passed away, it's of significant value because now you're in essence enticing them to pray for you. But on the other hand, what about this whole thing about this whole 12 months? Can we just assume that we don't need 12 months, maybe 11, maybe less, maybe that? The Chesed La'alafim in Siman 56, Alakha number 1, writes that in our times, no one can be sure that he will be relieved from Gehenom even after 12 months. And Rabbi Chaim Vital taught us that although our sages taught that the wicked are punished in Genom for 12 months, a soul might be sentenced to years of harsh punishment before it's even permitted to descend to Genom. So here, this whole notion of maximum punishment of 12 months, first of all, is talking about a completely different generation. Different type of people. Second of all, it's talking about the wicked among Israel, meaning people that are still considered part of Israel, meaning they weren't Mechale Shabbat. Perhaps they, uh, you know, they were nice, they had bad character traits, maybe they even stole something, uh, they hit somebody, you know, different types of sins that, that made them wicked, but they're still considered part of Am Yisrael because they didn't violate Shabbat or become an idol worshiper. Those people are not considered part of Am Yisrael. Their, you know, their decree of punishment is forever. But even here, the Chesed Lalafim is teaching us that in his generation, needless to say ours, don't have a right to assume anyone is going to be in Genom for only 12 months. Why? Unfortunately, it's something that doesn't need that much explanation. 
Now, furthermore, we see, Rabotai, that a person can actually help those that have passed on with their actions. If you do mitzvot, you learn Torah, you give tzedakah, you do tshuva. All of these actions, and you do it in the name of someone that you uh, care about, that has passed away, that can certainly help that neshama. We saw that he, David Melech was even able to help his son Absalom. Of course, no one in this generation is David Melech, but the point being is we have documented proof that someone that has passed away can be helped even after they've passed away by the good actions of someone that's still living in this world. But what about a convert? What about someone that has converted to Judaism following Torah and Mitzvot, but they have not only a wicked family, but someone like, let's just say, Nebuchadnezzar, meaning it doesn't get worse than that. Nebuchadnezzar made every sin under the sun, whether it was idolatry or LGBTQ or it was destroying the Bet HaMikdash, literally, the worst of the worst. Can somebody help somebody like him? Let's see. Now, our Holy Torah tells us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves converts. 36 different times, and then if you count other places in the Torah, it's literally hundreds of times. But 36 places in the Torah, it talks about HaKadosh Baruch Hu's special protection and love of converts. But yet... The Gemara in multiple places, including Masechet Nida, page 13b, says that converts are a skin disease for Am Yisrael. Someone abandoned their idolatry, abandoned their way of life, converted to Judaism, follows the one and only God of Israel, considered a skin disease? That doesn't sound like a compliment. That doesn't sound like the 36 expressions of love and protection that HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us in the Torah about converts so much so that the Rambam, Paskins La'alachad, that a Jew has to love every other Jew that is obviously considered a lover of Hashem, someone that follows Torah and mitzvot. But if that Jew is a convert, he has to love that Jew even more than the other Jews. In fact, he has to love that Jew as much as he loves God. This is unacceptable to some people that want to make their own rules. But this is what the law is. This is what Torah says. This is what the Rambam paskins la'alacha. So how can you say that someone is so special is a skin disease? Skin disease doesn't sound good. Skin disease sounds terrible. Anyone that has experienced any type of skin disease doesn't look at skin disease as something favorable. So how could this be? Now, of course, the heretics, especially those missionaries that try to distort the Torah, will always look at things like this in order to capitalize on them and say, look, the Jewish people are bad because of all types of misunderstandings they have of the Talmud. What are the things, for example, that they... uh, they bring often is they say, look, the whole notion of having a rabbi is completely forbidden. And that's why a Christian will never call any rabbi a rabbi. They'll call him sir or they'll call them by their first name, but they hate the whole title of rabbi because their false testament tells them, you know, rabbis are bad. But even though the Torah says that we have our sages, we have our chachamim, don't go right or left. Say, yeah, no, no, that's only referring to the Levi tribe. If they're a Levi, 
then they're allowed to be the rabbis, the judges, and so on. Now this would be nice if it was true, but unfortunately their stupidity and ignorance is proven otherwise here in this parasha. In this parasha, we have one of the most righteous converts that ever lived, Itro, who not only hears HaKadosh Baruch Hu's glory and the extraordinary things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu did for Am Yisrael, as the parasha starts, Vaishma Itro, that Itro heard. He heard about the glory of God. He heard about God's reward and punishment against the Egyptians. He heard how God split the ocean for us. He heard all of these extraordinary things. And in chapter 12, uh, chapter 18, verse number 11 and 12, Itro does two extraordinary things. He says, Now I know that Hashem is great and there is no God other than Him. Because in the way that the Egyptians had taught to punish Israel, in exactly that way they themselves were punished. And then in 12 he talks about bringing a sacrifice in honor of God, Korban Ola. So Itro blessed HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 54, says that Itro became like a skin disease to Am Yisrael. Skin disease? You just blessed God. And if that's not enough, if you go to Masechet Nida, I'm sorry, Masechet Sanedrin, page 94a, you'll find something even more extraordinary. Not only did Itro bless HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name, but even more so, Itro on the spot took a knife and gave himself a Brit Milah, like Avraham Avinu. Itro took a knife, gave himself a Brit Milah, circumcision. Why? Itro heard all he needed to hear, I want to be a Jew. I want to be a Jew. That's it. Not... Maybe if you guys convince me, if I have enough money, if uh, this, if uh, that, no conditions, I've heard enough. Yitro blesses HaKadosh Baruch Hu, circumcises himself. Yitro converts to Judaism. Yitro converts to Judaism. So why call him a skin disease? Doesn't sound good, does it? Itro doesn't finish there. Itro also gives Moshe Rabenu some advice that ends up being the creation of the legal system in the world until this day. And for those heretics that come from the Messianic Jews, which are really Christians in disguise, that say that only the Levies can be the rabbis, Itro also disproved them. Why? Because Itro said that you have to have the leaders of thousands, the leaders of hundreds, the leaders of fifties, and the leaders of the tens. And that's exactly what HaKadosh Baruch Hu allowed to happen, and that's what Moshe Rabbeinu instituted. Now, the Torah tells us that there were 600,000 men between the ages of 20 and 60. It's needless to say there was at least that many women, and certainly many more kids than that, and obviously people older than 60, but 600,000 men, if that's what we base our number on, just the men, not the older ones, not the children, not the women, that means that we will have 78,601 judges. Leaders of thousands, 600,000, you need to have 600. Leaders of hundreds, 600,000, you need 6,000. Leaders of 50s, divide the 600,000 to 50, you get 12,000. 
And the leaders of tens simply just remove one zero from the 600,000, you have 60,000. Total of all of these leaders, of these judges, 78,601. Now, how does this disprove the whole notion that only the levies can be the judges or the rabbis or the leaders? Simple. The Torah tells us repeatedly how many levies there were. And there were only 22,000. Which means that if we have 78,601, the levies are not enough to meet that number. And certainly there was more of the 78,000, but even if you're conservative and you only base it off of the 600,000, you still get a 78,000. This all came from Itro. Itro fought idolatry back then. Itro is still fighting idolatry today. Itro came from Ham. Ham, the son of Noah, was the Egyptians, but Itro didn't, wasn't really an Egyptian. Either way, Itro did not come from Avram Avinu, yet he followed in the footsteps of Avram Avinu. And he gave himself Brit Mila. Itro's daughter married Moshe Rabbeinu. Itro's other daughter married Aaron Cohen. You have all types of wonderful things happening here. In fact, one of the greatest things that we have in the Torah is the story of Itro. Why? Because Itro is in essence the best explanation of what the skin disease is. Because the Torah says, Itro did all these wonderful things after he blessed God. He was like a skin disease for Am Yisrael. Blessing God's a good thing. Instituting or at least giving the idea, having the merit to give the idea to the Jewish judicial system is a good thing. Giving yourself Brit Milah is a good thing. Conversion to Judaism is a good thing. Why a skin disease? You see, Rabotai, if a person learns Torah, they will find the answers to every single question that exists. And that's why the Gemara in Masechet Megillah says, Yagata umatzata ta'amin. Yagata filomatzata al ta'amin. If you toiled and you found the answer, I believe you. If you toiled, you didn't find the answer, I don't believe you. What do you mean I don't believe you? I didn't find the answer. I know you didn't find the answer, but that's not because you toiled. It's because you didn't toil. I don't believe you toiled if you didn't find the answer. But if you told me you toiled and you have an answer, I believe you. I believe you. So now skin disease, the Holy Gemara, the Talmud Bavli, says these converts are like a skin disease, Tam Israel. Why? Itro. It's a perfect example. Why? Itro could have been the worst person on planet earth, could have been the Pope, could have been continue being the Pope. He chose to abandon all of it, abandon the money, the private jets, the big company, the big personality, the big YouTube channel, the, the fame, the, what? he abandoned everything. Why? Vaishmaitro. He heard about the glory of God, he abandoned everything, lost everything, but gained everything at the same time. He came and converted to Judaism, gave himself Brit Milah, followed the law, went back to his nation to convert the rest of his family, and 40 years later, arrived at Eretz Israel with over a hundred thousand people and said, I want to learn Torah. They said, yeah, but you are the father-in-law of Moshe Rabbeinu. You can have the entire city of Yitro, the best part of the land. He went to the best part of the land and said, where's the Torah? No, 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 we don't teach Torah. Here's vacation. He says, I didn't come here for vacation. I didn't come here to Eretz Yisrael for vacation. I want to learn Torah. He said, you want to learn Torah? Go to Midbar Yehuda. Go to the desert of Yehuda. Over there they teach Torah. Itro and his whole family went to the desert, left vacation island, vacation resorts. Why? They want to go learn Torah. Itro outlived Moshe Rabbeinu. 
יתרו אין תל ארץ ישראל. ב-Yeddy is called skin disease. Why skin disease? יתרו abandoned all the evil and became צדיק. יתרו is named of the parasha that we received the Torah. יתרו blessed הקדוש ברוך הוא. And this was a rebuke for Am Yisrael. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, You have praised me. You have prayed to me. For all of the things that I do. But when it came to the miracles that I performed in Egypt, at Yam Suf, Here in a desert, bringing man from Shemaim. None of you blessed me. You prayed, yes. Praised, yes. Blessed, you didn't bless. Itro blessed me. Itro instituted the law of blessing HaKadosh Baruch Hu when we receive a miracle. And this was a rebuke for the rest of Am Yisrael that saw and heard much more than Yitro. So everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah, this convert, he's so righteous, he's making us look bad, even though we're all so righteous, even though we're all so religious. Says the Gemara, these converts, when they are righteous, when they follow the Torah, like Yitro, they make the rest of the Jews not feel so good. Why? We've been Jews our whole life. You just became a Jew five, ten years ago and you're more religious than us. You're more committed to us. When someone tells us, listen, it's time to go pray, we're like, okay, we have to pray. Someone tells you, it's time to pray. You start running to shul. You're excited to pray. You're looking forward to talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. When someone says, yeah, this is Shul Torah. Okay, we come to the Shul Torah. But as soon as we arrive, we see you're already there. You've been learning for the shield before the shield already started. The convert, that's a righteous convert. He's like a skin disease. Why? If you're not really, really glued to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, like he is, he's going to make you feel bad about yourself. Why? He's a rebuke. How is it that this new convert, five, ten years, is more religious than you? is more committed to Hashem than you. How is it? On the other hand, says the Gemara, the convert is a skin disease in an unfavorable way. You know when? When this convert does not follow the Torah, he converted for the wrong reasons. He converted for a girl. She converted for a guy. They converted for money. They converted for all types of other wrong reasons. Or better yet, they converted for the right reasons, but they abandoned the way. She converted with the right intentions, but she forgot those intentions at the Bedin and she started walking around immodestly. She has clothes on, but they're missing sleeves. She's wearing pants that technically only belong to her husband. She thinks that the whole world needs to know the definition and shape of her body. She speaks like she's a truck driver on I-95 yelling at somebody who cut him off. When she left, the whole community hears. Modesty, she doesn't even know what it means, even though when she converted, she says, not seven ishma, I'm going to do it. When he converted and they told him you have to do Brit Milah, he said, yeah, sure, no problem. I'll cut off a piece of my body. No problem, as long as I don't feel it. But as time passed and less Torah was learned and the excitement dissipated, all of a sudden he's wasting seed. All of a sudden he's promiscuous. All of a sudden he's cheating on his wife. All of a sudden his girlfriend is a porno uh, film. All of a sudden he's become... A skin disease. It was better off you didn't convert. And many times these types of converts, the bad converts, the ones that don't follow the Torah, 
They are the skin disease of Am Yisrael. Why? Because they end up being the worst type of people. The ones that become part of the Erev Rav. The ones that become the enemies of God as well as the nation of Israel. See, Rabotai, on one hand we see that a convert can be skin disease in a positive way, on the other end, skin disease in a negative way. Where are we going to be? Now, what does it really take? What does it really take? The parasha starts... With the word Vaishma Yitro. Yitro heard. What did he hear? He heard about the miracles. He heard about the wonders. He heard about all these wonderful things. And it was enough for him to change. It was enough for him to abandon all of the evil, all of the falsehood. Now, why do I need to read about it today, 3,334 years later? Why do you need to read it 3,334 years later? And again, next year, and the following year, and the following year, and the following year, until Mashiach comes, whenever that may be. You had to read it last year, and the year before, and the year before, and every year that you've been alive. Why do I need to know that, okay, it is great. But why do I need to hear this? Because just like Yitro had the opportunity to hear, to see the truth, so did you. You've watched my Shure Torah. You've opened your eyes. You've seen how life works. Did you hear enough? Did you hear enough to be like Yitro? Well, let's see. Yitro heard about what God did to the Egyptians. Heard what God did for the Jewish people. What about you? That you're on the fence of whether you should do tshuva or not. You're on the fence of whether it's time to convert or not. We're not trying to push anybody to do anything they don't want to do. The question is, where do you see yourself if you compare yourself to Itro? Itro heard about what God said. You, on the other hand, if you've watched enough of my films, you've watched Torah science and ancient wisdom and many other lectures where I discuss the scientific proof of God, such as the Gemara in Masechet, Brachot, page 32b, says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us nearly a thousand years before telescopes or even a thought in anybody's mind, needless to say an invention, how many stars are in the universe? 10643400000000000000000. In year 2004, a supercomputer in Australia discovered a number using supercomputers, almost identical to what the Torah says as far as the number of stars in the universe. There are endless proofs of the scientific truth of the Torah and the creation of God. You heard it. You also heard the rational proofs. In so many words, if I told you that the watch that's on your hand was somehow created by itself because a bunch of metal decided to gather together through some strong winds and over a long, long period of time it became a watch, you obviously would not believe it. The same token, if you bought a phone or whether you bought a microwave or a refrigerator or any other device, it came with instructions. And if millions of people told you that they witnessed the people that built this watch, or this device that you bought, you'd believe them. Why? This is simply enough evidence. Here we see that Akadosh Baruch who created the world that cannot create itself, 
while the watch is certainly a great invention, takes a lot of wisdom, so does a phone, so does a computer, and a microwave, and a refrigerator, and an airplane, they all are nothing in comparison to the creation of even a flower, the creation of your eye, and needless to say, the creation of the world or the universe, and how the world works. Everything is perfect. Obviously, there has to be a creator to all of this, and this creator is certainly smarter than his creation, and if the creation knows to provide an instruction set for anything it creates, then the Creator obviously also provides an instruction set. And if millions of people testify that they saw the words of God, they heard the words of God all at the same time, that's enough evidence to convince anyone that still considers themselves rational. If you look at archaeological proofs, whether you're looking at stories from the Torah or you're looking at different parts of the world, you can see endless amount of archaeological evidence of the Torah, whether it's what happened in Jerusalem, the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash, the time of King David, the coins of Chizkiyahu, the Teva of Noach, or even uh, the Gergeshites that ran away, one of the Canaanite nations that ran away from Yeshua Benun when he arrived in Israel, where there's a museum in Holland over there where there's literally a tablet of some kind where the Gilgashites are writing we all ran away from the evil Yeshua Benun and the Israelites the enemy wrote about us and this is still available today and there are endless archaeological evidence of the things that happened in the Torah you heard this right there's also mathematical proofs whether it's the number pi or it's different types of numerical a, uh, calculations that are used in the world of science, in the world of mathematics, in physics. There's a film called The Mathematical Proofs of God. Literally, there's so much evidence in there mathematically, you have to be stamped, mentally challenged to, to not believe in God after watching the film. Now, at the same token, you have evidence from bitachon bitachon stories where you see that there is divine providence in people's lives and of course even your own whether you've watched my film Hashem took back his millions and you see all of the extraordinary and amazing miracles that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us both on the painful side and on the pleasurable side or the different stories that I've told you over the years, things that happened to us, where just years ago, when after we lost everything, all of the financial windfall of being on Wall Street for nearly 20 years, doing over a billion dollars in business and all types of good stuff, all of it was lost. That in itself was a miracle, by the way. We literally got to a point where I arrived at a lecture in Canada one time, and when somebody asked me, if I'm doing all of this to make a lot of money, I showed him my bank account in front of hundreds of people which showed something around $700, all of which I received that day from some anonymous donor, meaning that I arrived to Canada with zero in my account. No one paid for my flight, no one paid for my ticket, no one paid for anything that time. But we still arrived, we still came. Why? Because our job in the world was not to make millions, it was to help people earn Olam Abba. But today, Baruch Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided to change things after we've passed a series of tests and of course, we pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that we continue passing them. We now run an organization with a monthly budget of nearly $200,000. Meaning, well, the average person out there is hustling and bustling and doing whatever they can to maybe hopefully make 50, 100, 200, 300 thousand dollars and they've been at the same career in the same field and the same everything else and Hashem blessed them with what He gave them. Hashem blessed us with what He gave us and now we have a couple hundred thousand dollars every single month that we can use to help Am Yisrael get close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Give the books, give the USBs, give the lectures 
Give endless amount of chesed to poor people, to avrichim, have two kolos, all these wonderful things that simply HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided to allow us to do and for all of those wonderful people that help us. Every single one of them knows that they've never received a phone call from me or anybody else from my organization asking them for money. Meaning that all of this comes simply because HaKadosh Baruch Hu decides to make enough people smart each and every single month to decide to donate to Be'ezrat Hashem and be partners with us in the Kiddush Hashem that we're doing. So when you go from nothing to millions in the business world, people love the story. When you go from millions to nothing, people feel bad for the story. But when you go back up without even working in Wall Street, but rather working for a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and a Kadosh Baruch Hu makes you a millionaire again, in essence, you're not using it for the same things, and I don't even pay my rent from the organization. It comes from my own personal pocket. But the point being is that a Kadosh Baruch Hu showed us enough miracles for you to learn from, for you to benefit from. You saw it. You witnessed it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu also showed us enough teachings about reward and punishment to convince even the stones to scream even louder. Whether it's the countless sources we brought from the five books of Moses or the Nevi'im or the Ketuvim, the writings and the prophets, or it's the Talmud, or the Zohar, or Chassidut, or Shuchan Aruch, or other types of Chachamim that have written Musar books and Alachic books. We've literally brought thousands upon thousands of sources over the years to prove how reward and punishment, one of the 13 principles of faith, is very much alive and well and applicable to our lives today, both in this world and the next. We've seen the righteous benefit and the wicked suffer. Not always in the timing that we thought, but a Kadosh Baruch doesn't ask us for permission or for what we think. He simply runs his world. All you need to do is give it time and you'll see reward and punishment be implemented. You've seen reward and punishment in your own life. You've seen when you heard enough teachings about wasting seed and immorality and you still ignored it, the next day you lost money. You've seen when you've known enough about what Shabbat is and you decided that you don't care about it. You've lost blessings. You've seen that while in the beginning it seems like going against God seems good, everyone arrives at the same dead end. A dead end full of regrets. As the Gemara says, the wicked people regret. They live a life full of regret. So you've seen reward and punishment. And if that wasn't enough to see life, we also showed you the endless proofs of the mystical aspects, the afterlife. Whether it's showing you proofs of life after death or genom and the different levels in it in the chambers, and Kafakela and Chibuta Kevel, all of these extraordinary teachings that are unfortunately almost impossible to find in the English language, we've brought it to you on the big screen or a small screen, always for free, always full of sources, literally with hundreds and hundreds of sources. You've seen it, you've heard it. Akadosh Bahu provided us. Prophecy. Prophecy in the Torah of what will happen at the end of days. Is the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, Perek Chelek, or Masechet Sota, page 49, towards the end of the Masechet, tells us all of the different things that will happen at the end of days. And literally, when we've read it with you and studied it with you, multiple times, it was like reading the news. Whether it was the news about your community or the news about the world at large and the global war that's going on, whether it's the leaders that are going against their own people that vote them in power or even the daughter-in-law fighting with the mother-in-law. Hyperinflation, desecration of a Torah and mockings of Talmidei Chachamim, all of these different things, they're already prophesied in the Torah. 
You've heard it. You've seen it. You've studied it with us. And if that wasn't enough, HaKadosh Baruch Hu also gave us clarifications about Mashiach and how the Mashiach is going to come and is going to bring salvation to those that have heard the word of God and have done tshuva and have changed their life, have changed their ways. Whether it's David the Melech saying, Ubaletzion Goel, Shave Pesha Biakov, that the Goel, the um, Mashiach, the Redeemer, will come and save, bring salvation to those that used to be criminal, meaning those that have done tshuva and have changed their ways. Or it's the countless promises in the different parts of the Torah, like the Gmarain Masechet Sanedrin, which is in essence. Not only a promise that the Goel will come, but that the Goel will come after major disasters hit the world, a war, evil people. And some even say there could be a war of giant monsters of the sea. Some say these monsters are literally monsters. Some say these monsters are Big ships full of weapons. Both are easy to believe these days. The point is that when the Mashiach comes, there's not going to be any time for people to just discover God for the first time and change everything. Why you have to do it now? Hence the reason why Kadosh Baruch Hu brought us the scientific proofs, rational proofs, archaeological proofs, mathematical proofs, the bitachon and emunah and life proofs, the ashkechah pratit proofs, the reward and punishment proofs, the prophetic proofs, the Mashiach proofs, and in so many words, enough proofs that put you in a position where you have even more information to make an educated decision on than Itro had. And if that's not enough, what will be? What will be? Well, let's see, Rabotai. If we're looking at the converts and we say, wait a minute, maybe there's some wicked people that shouldn't convert, should convert, Akadosh Bahu runs the world. Akadosh Bahu runs the world. He lets certain people convert and certain people not, certain people for good, certain people for punishment, all types of things. We don't have to worry about who does what and when. We have to worry about ourselves. There are some people that come into the world of Judaism either as converts or Nuba Lechuva, and before they have even fixed 10% of themselves, they're already full of criticisms of the people that are part of Am Yisrael. Oh, nobody knows anything. Nobody prays you. Nobody this, nobody that. Don't worry about nobody. Worry about yourself. You've already been coming to, 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 to the synagogue for a few months. You have... You have to pay your dues first. Don't worry about everybody. If you want to help everybody by providing them information, no problem. But criticizing everybody, you're not in the position to criticize anyone. Criticize yourself. Have you heard and changed like Yitro? Well, you see, Rabotai, the Gemara in Masechet Yevamot, page 49b, says that a Gentile is not obligated to convert to Judaism. He's not obligated. But once he knows that Judaism is the truth, once he knows that Torah is emet, he must attempt to convert immediately, no less than itro. Immediately. Meaning, you're living as a Gentile, you're not even sure what's right and wrong, your father told you some guy died for you, your mother told you that uh, some guy pretended to speak to some uh, prophet in the desert, another uh, person that's a relative of yours tells you there's some statue in China and he's somehow going to help you. And somebody else told you, no, 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 you know who's going to help you? The idol of money, the idol of gold. All types of opinions. So you're not even sure what's the truth. You like the lectures, you like the rabbi, but you still have some doubts of who, what, when, and how. Okay, so you try to be a righteous Noahide. But if you're put in a position 
where you can go to a Jewish community, you can live a Jewish life, you know the truth, and you choose otherwise, you have a problem. You have a problem. Now, I'm not saying go do what Itro did and they're going to convert you. It doesn't work that way. You have to go through the system. You have to have a sponsoring rabbi, make the necessary life changes, whether it's a change your job, get a job, uh, uh, go and live in a community full of Jewish people that you could obviously learn from, learn with, change your behavior, change your diet, learn the necessary laws, pray every day, all the things that are necessary. This is a process. Once you're in a process, once you're doing everything you can, you're in good shape. The day of conversion, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to decide. You don't have to worry so much about that. You just have to worry about your maximum effort. But if you've already known the truth for two, three, four, five years, and you're not even sure whether you're on the path of conversion or not, you're not even sure whether you're ready or not, you're not even sure if you want to or not, you have a problem. Why? Vaishma Yitro. Yitro, he heard. A lot less than you. And he already made all the changes. You know who else did it? Gemara, Masechet Sanhedrin, page 96b, says, Nevuzardan, the murderer, murdered millions of Jews, was the general under Nevuchanetzel. Realized the truth of God, realized the truth of the Torah, abandoned everything on the spot and converted to Judaism. The descendants of Sisera, which is Rabbi Akiva, ended up teaching Torah in Yerushalayim. Descendants of Sancheriv, Shmaya Naftalion, Converted to Judaism. Descendants of Haman, which was Rav Shmuel Bar Shilat, converted to Judaism. Some of the greatest people that ever lived started from a bad past, a bad family, a bad start, a bad yichus. But that didn't stop them from going in the same path as Yitro, who himself started in a horrible path. He was the Pope, the chief idol worshiper, before he became one of the greatest Jews that ever lived. But then we get to Rabotai, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was an enemy of Am Yisrael. But yet his descendants wanted to convert to Judaism. And the Malachi Asharet came to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and says, How can you allow these descendants of the one who destroyed your house in the world come under the, the Shekhinah and become Jews? How could this be? The angels couldn't deal with it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, leave them alone. If they succeed in converting, good. We welcome them. Even though they're descendants of the worst person on planet earth, Nebuchadnezzar, who murdered more people than Hitler did. We'll let them convert. And in fact, if they convert, they will be the tikkun for Nebuchadnezzar himself. Meaning, the level of the conversion, when it's for the right reasons, is so valuable in Shemaim that even Nebuchadnezzar, the evil monster that destroyed the Bet HaMikdash, raped every king, literally, tortured people like it was nothing, had an idol fly in the air through magnets at the time of Daniel. This monster 
if his descendants would have converted to Judaism, it would have rectified his neshama. Can you believe such a thing? The ministering angels, Malachi Sharet, said, how, how can this be? Hashem said, leave them alone. If they succeed to overcome the obstacle, good. If not, not. Opportunity is available to all. They did not succeed. But at the very least, we learn from them how powerful it is to go and follow Hashem despite all the tests. Hence the reason why Yitro is the ultimate convert where he tells you if you're going to live like me, if you're going to be a righteous convert, you are going to be something special, not only to the people around you, not only to the people that learn from you, but even to people you care about that already left this world and weren't exactly on the good lovers list of Hashem. You could even help them. But if you are a wicked convert, there's simply nobody stupider and worse than you. Now, if you remember, I told you morality is very important to Hashem. So are converts. How did the two combine? Bilam. Parashat Balak. Bilam tries to curse Am Yisrael. HaKadosh Baruch Hu transfers his curses into blessings. The Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, Perek Chelek, page 105b, gives us the behind the scenes of what happened. Bilam wanted to curse. We know exactly what he wanted to do. HaKadosh Baruch Hu did not let it happen, so he put an angel inside his mouth. Why do you have to put an angel inside his mouth? Just pretty much force the guy to say what you want to say or let him say what he wants to say and don't fulfill it. Chachamim say if he would have said whatever he wanted to say to curse Am Yisrael it could have been Chilul Hashem. Why? Because he could curse Am Yisrael Hashem does not fulfill it but people still hear what he said and years later when Hashem punishes Am Yisrael for different sins they've made and bad things happen to them, people say, oh, you see, maybe this is because of the curse of Bilam. So Hashem does not allow Bilam to even curse. But what did Bilam really want to say? He wanted to say, Lo yerecha nodif. May their fragrance not waft. What does that mean, may the great? He says, May the many mitzvot that they perform fail to entice other people, fail to have a good reputation. What do you care about whether people like our mitzvot or not? Bilam says, the way I want to curse Am Yisrael is I want Am Yisrael's mitzvot to look difficult to the non-Jews. So much so that nobody wants to convert. So much so that Am Yisrael has to depend on itself. And nobody likes the Torah that's outside of Am Yisrael. Bilam wanted to curse all of the converts to simply disappear and never exist. Hence the reason why Kadosh Bechut could not allow him to say such a thing. See, so see, Rabotai Yekarim, Akadosh Baruch Hu gave us clear information to make a decision. Are you going to be the lover of God and follow all of his mitzvot? If you are already a Jew, simply become a religious, orthodox Jew that follows all of the Torah? You're going to follow modesty? You're going to follow family purity? You're going to follow Kashrut, Shabbat? 
all of the different things, everything you know, and continue to learn more. If you're a non-Jew that's been on the fence of whether to convert or not, if this wasn't enough, please stop watching our lectures because nothing else is going to help you. You should just simply decide that you're too spiritually dumb to ever do anything about it. But if this was enough, then it's time you do everything you need to do to at least get on the right path and do the best thing you can. Where the destination ends up being, whether it's next week, next month, next year, or 10 years from now, that's not up to you. What's up to you is your effort. Your effort, just like Itro's effort. You heard enough. The scientific proofs, the rational proofs, the logical proofs, archaeological proofs, mathematical proofs, emuna and bitachon proofs, ashkacha proofs, practically every proof that exists, even without being at Mount Sinai, at least not that you can remember. You've seen enough, you've heard enough, even more than Yitro, now it's time to do enough. It may be Hashem's will that becomes your will, and you are able to fulfill the entire Torah alongside all of Am Yisrael, to be able to sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name and say, I want to be just like my forefathers. And Bez Hashem, we all succeed in doing so. With that being said, you guys can start asking questions and Bez Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give us the answers. Can you say Kaddish longer than 12 months? Yes, absolutely. You can say Kaddish for, you know, all, all the time. Now, women uh, generally do not say Kaddish on their uh, parents. They usually hire somebody, a man, to say Kaddish on their behalf. Uh, they're not allowed to say Kaddish in the Bit Knesset. Um, but uh, there are times where if, let's say, a woman has a Shil Torah or a group of women that are uh, saying Teilim in her house, and uh, then the woman can say Kaddish on her, uh, on her parents. Uh, but if, uh, and no one needs to protest, but if it's at synagogue, a woman does not say Kaddish, uh, she has to uh, give it to a man to do it for her, whether it be her husband or Tomit uh, Chacham, uh, that uh, she gives something to or whoever it is, but somebody else has to do it for her. But it certainly can and should be beyond the year. Can you use digital thermometers on Shabbat if you're feeling sick? If you are choles yesh sakana, meaning a person that's sick in a sense where it's a life risk, then certainly you can use everything you need to, to, to get yourself out of the risk. But if it's just simply some fever, you have a cold or something like that, then no, you cannot use the digital thermometer. I've wanted to convert for years, but I don't live close enough to a synagogue. Okay, then make the changes and move to a Jewish community. I understand it's not easy, I understand it's not cheap, but uh, you found ways to do other things that you want in your life. If you really want to become a Jew, then you'll find a way to do this too. I plan to buy Jewish books and give to the Christian community to learn about the root of the Jew Jewish religion. I would spend your energy and money on helping Jews become closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu rather than uh, using Jewish books to teach the Christians for many reasons. Number one, uh, the Jews have a much bigger obligation to follow Judaism. And uh, number two, it's a much bigger reward uh, for you uh, to, uh, to actually help a Jew than to help a uh, non-Jew. Now, if you happen to run into somebody that's a friend, family, or somebody you know uh, that you want to share a lecture with them or something like that to help them, fine. But uh, if resources as far as money and things of that nature should be spent more on helping Jews become Jewish according to the Torah, uh, than, than otherwise. But again, there's no, uh, no obligation to, uh, you could do what you want. I'm just, um, just giving you the, uh, the profit and loss uh, statement of the future. Um, your work is a blessing. You helped me a lot, Baruch Hashem. What is the thing about Mashiach killing evil people with his words or something? There's a verse in the Navi. It says, Beruach piv yamit rasha. Beruach piv yamit rasha means with the 
the ha of his mouth, he'll be able to kill the wicked. He won't have to use weapons or anything like that. Uh, how can someone who yearns to observe the mitzvah of honoring one's parents, if they're a convert, and two, they haven't spoken to their biological parents in many years due to disagreement, how can they keep the mitzvah? Well, number one, if they converted, it, once their parents uh, pass away, they can say Kaddish on them. Uh, secondly, even if their parents are uh, alive, you could do mitzvot on their behalf. Third, you can call them. And uh, talk to them and say, listen, I'm living this life. We could either uh, you know, talk and have uh, some type of uh, healthy communications, uh, you know, about um, you know, some type of uh, neutral uh, you know, ground and uh, you know, without you trying to entice me to go back to your beliefs. Uh, or we can continue not talking. And I can assure you that the you know, vast majority of parents will be happy to hear from you. Um, but uh, more than anything else, also, you could do mitzvot on uh, their behalf. Uh, have some people that, uh, you know, either, uh, you know, they pray for their parents to do tshuva and abandon idolatry. Some donate money on their behalf uh, every month. Uh, they have their, uh, their donation, is, uh, and then they have the donation that they donate, in essence, on behalf of their parents, um, so, you know, it's different people do different things, but you could certainly do mitzvot and, and help your parents. Um, let's see. Are the lost tribes really lost in time? I'm not really sure what that means, lost in time. I mean, there's, they're here in the world. It's just that we'll have to wait until Mashiach comes in order for him to uh, unveil who's who, what tribe does each person belong to, and there's also a, uh, a um, teachings from the sages that uh, the vast majority of the uh, tribes, of the Jewish tribes, are not part of the so-called you know, first world. They're living behind the mountains, and they're going to be unveiled at the time of Mashiach. They're going to be warriors that uh, that fight alongside Mashiach against the enemy. The tribe of Reuven, tribe of Shimon, these are some of the warriors that will come and uh, destroy the enemy. Alongside Mashiach, there's going to be a war. First is going to be Mashiach ben Yosef, then Mashiach ben David. So, uh, some of the warriors are going to be the uh, lost tribes. What is a golem? I heard about it in a video and that it, that it is talked about in the Zohar. What was it used for? A golem is not just talked about in the Zohar, a golem is also talked about in the Gemara. Uh, the Gemara has multiple times where different sages uh, create a golem, which is, uh, in essence, taking a earth and using different uh, teachings from the Sefer Abriya, the, uh, the Book of Life that uh, is uh, uh, said to be uh, written by Avram Avinu. Uh, and uh, using different uh, Kabbalistic teachings, Kabbalah Ma'asit, uh, that's in it to, uh, in, in such a way that you can, in essence, bring life to this earth, uh, and it becomes, a, in essence, a uh, living being, you know, that, has, that looks like a regular human being. Uh, the big difference is that it, that it can't speak. It can do whatever you tell it to do, uh, but uh, it can't speak. Uh, and there are times in the Gemara where it talks about, uh, you know, this, how do you use it? Can it be counted in Minyan? Uh, you know, which is the answer is no. Uh, can, uh, can you, you know, you can use it to, def you know, to fight against the uh, people that are trying to hurt the, uh, the Jewish people. Like, for example, one golem can pretty much do uh, more than uh, all of what the uh, Israeli government is doing in Gaza over there. Uh, you know, so he doesn't have to worry about dying. And he certainly does not have to worry about politics or the uh, contributions of any other country. 
So if they would have had a couple of golems, they could pretty much finish Gaza within you know, a very short period of time. But unfortunately, we don't have a golem. Uh, there were also the Maral Miprag had a uh, golem. Another Chachamim made golems. In fact, the, uh, the Gaon Mi Vilna, uh, I believe it's him, yeah, Gaon Mi Vilna says that he was in the process of making a golem when he was eight years old. He was already such a genius at that time that he was able to make a golem at eight years old, but the Chachamim of the generation came to him and asked him to stop, and he listened to the Chachamim and did not continue with it. But there were times that, uh, that uh, different Jewish sages made golems in order to uh, help us uh, defend the Jewish people against uh, the enemies that would, that would come and kidnap uh, women and kids, kill people, you know, all types of things. Uh, but this is not just in the Zohar, this is also in the Babylonian Talmud, the uh, Yerushalmi Talmud, as well as many, many other uh, Sfarim that discuss different examples. The most famous one, I would say, is probably the Golem of Prague. And if people only use that as an example, even though there's a place that says this is where he was, if you go to Prague today, you'll see it. Um, you know, there are people that say, no, it didn't really happen, it didn't this. If people only use that as the example of a golem, then they can say, nah, it's not true. But then you see it in the Gemara. So what, the Gemara is not true either? Uh, one of the Chachamim sent his golem to the Bet Midrash uh, to get uh, something from uh, one of his... Uh, uh, one of his uh, friends, and one of his, you know, he, he looks like a regular human being. So how did he know he's a golem? Because when he couldn't speak, he realized, oh, you're a golem? No, 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 go back to your dust. I don't permit a golem to exist. And he said something, and that golem became dust. You know, so, so you know, the, the world is very different today than it was at the time of the, uh, of the sages. But uh, point being is that there is, uh, there is a way to do it. There is a way to do it. All right, let's see. Let's see if TikTok has any. Are you Mizrahi or Ashkenazi? I'm Sephardic Jew. Okay. My grandparents are from Tripoli. Lama Asu Lagid Shem Hashem. Why is it forbidden to say the name of Hashem? Because it's one of the Ten Commandments. A Kadosh Baruch Hu says don't use his name in vain. He's not Yaron, he's not Michael, he's not David, he's Hashem. And his name is too holy to be said, uh, you know, just uh, without it being part of a verse or a prayer. Do I speak Hebrew? Question was whether I speak Hebrew. Um, let's see. I never understood the people that keep writing the same thing 500 times. And it's usually not even a question, it's usually either a comment or some foolish statement. I don't really understand it. What do you think happens when you write the same thing 500 times? Like what's the, uh, what is the, uh, what, what is the point? I don't know, I don't understand it. Strange people. Maybe I'm strange for not understanding it. I just, I don't get it. If anybody here understands why people write the same thing 50 times, like for example, people say, Nachman, Nachman, Meoman, and they just keep writing it 50 different times. What happens? Like, what do you think happens when you say that? Uh, like, if anybody understands that, please explain it to me. I, I don't have the tools to understand it. I tried to do Shiduchim, and someone contacted me regarding a man, age 69, never married, and he only wants to marry a woman not older than 43 because he wants children. What is the appropriate Torah response to him? Uh, well, if uh, he is a Torah-observant Jew, he follows the Torah, he follows the mitzvot, he has a Shiduch resume, you can try. You could certainly try. There's nothing wrong with what he's asking for. He's uh, looking to have children. He's looking to fulfill the mitzvot. 
Uh, there's certainly no, uh, no point for him to marry a woman that's also 69 years old. Uh, he needs to marry a younger woman. And many of the Chachamim uh, married uh, a younger woman when it was their second marriage, uh, you know, when their first wife died. Uh, because they wanted to continue having uh, kids with the new wife. There's no problem with an older man marrying a woman that is able to have kids, even if she's 25 years or 30 years younger than him. Uh, the, the key is to make sure that he's doing it for the right reason. It's not just some sick old man that uh, wants to have arm candy. But if he follows the Torah, follows the mitzvot, it is perfectly appropriate for him to marry a younger woman if he can find somebody. Now, in a position that he has... Uh, I don't really believe that he will find a younger woman uh, that's willing to marry him unless he's either an extraordinary Talmit Chacham, like something beyond the norm, or he's extraordinarily wealthy. Uh, those are usually the only times that you're going to find such a uh, situation. Uh, hopefully it's the first and not the latter, but even if it's the latter, if he's 70 years old and he finds a girl that's willing to marry him that's younger and is able to bring kids to the world, Baruch Hashem. In relation to Bitachon, how and should we pray for assistance in our efforts, such as asking Hashem for success in learning Torah, or at work with our work ethic, or work in general? Uh, Certainly you should ask Hashem to help you, but of course you have to do your own effort. You can't ask Hashem to do it for you. He's not going to chew for you. Uh, you know, he, uh, you have to do your own effort. But if a person tries, you have to say, uh, Hashem, help me, you know, understand the Torah that I'm learning. Hashem, make my work successful. Uh, make my uh, efforts, you know, bring fruit to the world. That, there's no problem with that. But uh, a person still has to exert their own effort. Um, let's see. Oh, you wondered about the same thing of why people write the same thing 50 times? Oh, so, okay, so it's, I'm not alone. Other people also asking. So if you're one of the crazy people out there that's writing the same thing 50 times, like Nachman 50 million times, or I don't know, the Al Jazeera 50 million times, a terrorist 50 million times, whatever you're writing 50 million times, if you could explain it to us, why you keep writing it 50 million times, like what's the logic behind it? Because apparently there's a, there's a bunch of you. It's like a going thing. It's like a, it's like a thing to do. Uh, let us know. Let, educate us with your wisdom. Uh, what is the? We answered this already. Uh, no question. Answer these questions already. Oh, in it. Well, I answered that question also. Uh, here we go. I discovered the truth. Uh, yeah, yeah, I hope I jumped again. It's so annoying, this thing. Uh, I discovered the truth a year and a half ago. I want to convert. I live far away from a Jewish community. I've been doing uh, too many changes in my life, like modesty, incorporating kashrut. I'm studying to fix character traits. I got a job to start my process, but... With the new job I've got, I will have to work on Shabbat. I feel awful. Should I quit this job? Uh, is it okay to keep Shabbat when I have not made conversion yet? So there's a conversion syllabus on our website, and it's an interactive syllabus, meaning when you press the pictures, it gets you to different places. And one of the things is lectures. I have a whole playlist of lectures regarding conversion uh, and what you need to do and how the process is. Now, of course, for you to ever succeed in conversion, you're not only going to not be able to work on Shabbat, but also you'll have to move to a Jewish community. Uh, So if you're not able to move to a Jewish community right now, um, and then you're not really in a a conversion process, then you could, there's no problem with you working on Shabbat. You're not Jewish. Uh, But if you want to change that, then you'll have to change those two things. Are we allowed to read Tehillim at night with the circumstances in Israel? I heard an older shield that said at night is not allowed. I never said it's not allowed. I uh, have a lecture that actually is specifically answering this question. Are you allowed to read Tehillim at night? 
And if you hear it, you'll get the answer. If you're not Jewish yet, you aren't required. Okay, so you're answering for me. Thank you, Rabbi Ben Yosef. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's see. I think I answered all the questions. I think I answered all. I think I answered all the questions. Uh, let me see. What is the plan you have in Israel? Oh, we have a distribution uh, of books that we're doing in Israel next week. Uh, we're gathering a team of uh, guys that are going to help us distribute the book. This is for pay. Uh, the first uh, location is going to be in Tel Aviv. We're going to spend a day there and give the books out. We need uh, as many guys as possible. We already have close to 20 guys, but if you want to join us, make a few dollars and also some mitzvot. You can contact me and uh, we could add you to the team. We need serious workers, people that are not, uh, you know, uh, spoiled and uh, fragile. We need people that are, you know, give out books. You don't need to speak to anybody. You just need to have arms and legs and use them. Uh, that's pretty much what you need. If you also are able to speak and smile, that's a plus. But arms and legs are fantastic. Uh, da, 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 da. What is Ben Sirah? Ah, uh, the, uh, the Gemara says Ben Sirah was actually the son of Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet, that was uh, brought to the world in a very unusual, miraculous way. Uh, and, um, and the, the story goes where uh, Chachamim teach that uh, his uh, uh, Jeremiah was being uh, tortured by the Jewish people that he was rebuking, and they forced seed to come out of his body. This is why Jeremiah, you'll see in the uh, uh, in his uh, in his prophecy, one of the things he said that he cursed the day that he was born. And this is why, this is because the, uh, they forced him to, in essence, for seed to come out of his body. But because Jeremiah was so holy, HaKadosh Baruch Hu made this seed miraculously, miraculously go, uh, apparently into the drain somehow, and it actually entered the uh, womb of his daughter. Uh, and uh, his daughter gave birth to Ben Sirah. Now, of course, this is not incest. This is all the you know the hands of Hashem did this. Point being is, Ben Sirah came from there. Now, Ben Sirah was a very, very wise, wise man, and he wrote a book of similar to Proverbs, uh, and uh, it was considered uh, with a lot of wisdom. It was considered being uh, canonized and added to the Tanakh, uh, but because it was uh, not. Uh, divinely inspired it was just his wisdom uh, therefore it was not canonized it did not uh, meet the requirements of being part of the 24 books of the Tanakh they were all through prophecy and Ruach HaKodesh uh, so the Ben Sirah has a lot of wisdom in it uh, but it's not divinely inspired and therefore it was not canonized now as far as reading it uh, some Chachamim said that uh, it's not allowed, but then uh, Rabbi Akiva says that it is allowed to uh, read it after a person have studied all of the other, obviously, writings and, uh, you know, and teachings of the sages, and they're not just reading this as their main uh, Torah, that you're allowed to read it. It's not considered a book of the Chitzonim, which is a forbidden book. It's allowed to read it. It doesn't have... Uh, things that are, uh, you know, uh, heretical or anything like that. It's just that it's not divinely inspired. It's, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, has wisdom in it, has, you know, a lot of proverbs in it that are, you know, wise and teachings that are wise, but they're not divinely inspired, which is a world of difference between that and something that's divinely inspired, like Proverbs by Shlomo Amelech. Uh, but there are other books that are called Sifre Chitzonim, which are forbidden books. Uh, this is not one of them. Uh, 
Uh, either way, that's that's the uh, uh, short version of the story of Ben Sira. I want to become a Talmudic scholar, but I'm a new Baal Tshuva. What should I do? Uh, okay, so a uh, someone that's a Baal Tshuva needs to first know and learn how to be a Jew and not worry so much about titles and major achievements and also understand where they stand right now. Anyone that is truly a Talmudic scholar is someone that has studied for decades, not just a few years, but decades. And it's something that continues to build. It's not just like one day you just become a scholar and that's it, you're finished. Torah is something that you learn your whole life and you keep growing and growing and growing. That's why you'll see some of the great Chachamim throughout the generations that have published many works. You'll see that they're, the way that they write and how they write and even how they think can change over time. Uh, becomes more developed. Sometimes they, uh, you know, learn something new that they didn't know back then, 20, 30, 40 years ago when they first wrote the first book. So in their second book uh, that they wrote at that time, uh, things change, meaning that the Torah is something that you continue building on. It's not like uh, many other subjects out there where you pretty much learn uh, enough to be, in essence, considered a scholar, but there's not much more room for growth there unless you discover something new the torah has no end there are no end to the sages and uh, giant scholars that came before you and all of them spent their entire lives learning torah so for you to become a scholar prepare yourself for a lifelong of learning and Be'ezot Hashem, eventually uh, you'll have the merit to and the persistence to succeed but that should not be your main concern today. The main concern today is to learn to live like a Jew, which means learning Torah each and every single day, even if you're working, even if you're married, even if you're depressed, even if you're sick, even if you're busy, even if you're this, even if you're that. Learn Torah every day. Make time to learn Torah every single day, both from lectures like the one that you're listening to, uh, as well as from the books. The first thing that you should start learning is the, uh, as far as book, is the Chumash, the five books of Moses. Uh, the uh, Read the weekly parasha twice and commentary on it once. This is something that you need to do every single year, and it's certainly the first thing a person needs to read. Uh, aside from that, start reading Alachot. Uh, if you're a Sephardi Jew, learn uh, the laws uh, of the Shulchan Aruch, which, again, modern-day version of an uh, uh, application of it would be in Yalkut Yosef, or uh, uh, you know, the, the writings of uh, the Rishon Letzion, which, again, is the spearheaded by uh, by his father, Rav Vadi Yosef. But in English, the Yalkut Yosef is the best thing you can get. Get the volume of the Yalkut Yosef, start learning a few halachot every day, uh, start with the laws of Brachot, then go to the laws of Shabbat, and so on and so forth. Uh, aside from that, learn Musar. Learn Musar, you could either learn Musar from lectures like mine, uh, or you could learn Musar uh, from books. Uh, you could learn uh, Musar from uh, different uh, famous books of Musar from the previous generation, whether it's the, um, the writings of uh, uh, Rav Nisim Yagen, uh, or uh, the writings of Rav Vigdo Miller, uh, or uh, Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, uh, you have uh, you know previous generation as well. You have uh, uh, all the way to the uh, Rishonim. You have Sharet uh, Shuva, Chovot uh, Levavot. If you want to go in between them, you can go to Mesilat uh, Yesharim. You know things. There's there's many many different. Uh, writings of uh, sages of Musar. Point being is, learn Musar each day, learn Alakha each day, learn Torah each day. After that, uh, you've done that for some time, you can start learning, uh, depending on your age, if you're very young, you know, Mishnayot, if you're a little older, then, you know, uh, your mind is more developed, start learning Gemara. This, if you're able to learn with a rabbi or a Torah scholar, that would be great. If not, then learn uh, with uh, Art Scroll, and you can watch Shurim, you know, different lectures that people do on Daf Yumi on each Daf that you learn. It can help you 
you learn it, you know, both what you read as well as what the rabbi on the screen is saying, and you'll have a better understanding, not only of um, what you're actually reading, but also you'll get a better understanding of how to learn. Point being is, is that you have to learn all of these things, and you have to start applying things to your life, apply the laws that you learn to your life. So this is learning to be a Jew. And this is applicable to both a Jew that's starting to do tshuva, or a, uh, a non-Jew that's looking to convert and is just converted and so on. This is all necessary for everybody. This is the beginning. Learn how to be a Jew. Learn how to live like a Jew. Of course, if it's a woman, then you need to um, uh, learn the laws of modesty and, and, and focus on the laws that are pertaining to, uh, to women. Uh, but either way, it's a, uh, this is something that uh, everybody must do. Now, if you want to become a Torah scholar... Uh, then that means you'll have to do a lot more than the norm. Meaning, if, let's say, the average person uh, needs to learn two hours a day in order to at least cover all of his bases over, uh, you know, over time, uh, you won't be a Torah scholar, you won't be a Tomit Chacham, but at least you'll be a kosher Jew. Uh, if you want to be a Torah scholar, then you have to multiply that significantly. You have to, you know, eight uh, hours, ten hours, or, you know, or more. Perhaps over time, you know, once you've established uh, yourself uh, uh, and you already start uh, teaching and so on, uh, you, you may have uh, less time to learn uh, like you do when you're young. But uh, needless to say, when you're first starting out, you have to learn an enormous amount, enormous amount. But uh, more than anything else that I just said, if you want to succeed at both or as either a Jew or as a, uh, a Jew that's also a Torah scholar, you must make yourself a rabbi. A rabbi that you go to for guidance on everything, for learning, for ideology, uh, for questions, someone that's going to guide you. And, um, you know, that's very, very important because if you do everything on your own, you're, you know, you're bound to make major mistakes and not even realize it. So you need somebody that knows a lot more than you to at least guide you. They don't necessarily need to learn with you every day and uh, teach you how to read or anything, but uh, at the very least, they need, you need to have somebody guide, guide you of what to do and how to do it. And uh, if you do that, you could certainly become a kosher Jew, and you could certainly even become a Tomit Chacham, a Torah scholar over time. But uh, many times people uh, don't realize what a Talmudic scholar is, what a Torah scholar is, uh, and uh, they, just, uh, they just want the end product. They don't realize that uh, to even have a chance of becoming a Talmud Chacham, um, you're talking about decades, decades of learning and dedication and sacrifices, and maybe, maybe you'll become, you know, a uh, basic Talmud Chacham. Maybe. It's not, there's no guarantee that you'll become a Talmud Chacham, even if you learn 50 years. You'll become a kosher Jew, but Talmud Chacham... You know, that's, there's no guarantee of that. Hashem has to give that to you uh, after you've made pretty much every sacrifice under the sun. Many people say, oh, no, I wanna, I'm going to be a Torah scholar. I'm going to be a uh, Talmud Chacham. Okay, you don't understand what that means. You know, people, people think that just uh, if uh, maybe you know a few books or you say a few things by heart, that makes you Talmud Chacham. It doesn't make you Talmud Chacham. It doesn't make you Talmud Chacham. It's, uh, Talmud Chachamim are... Very, very special people, and uh, they, they go through uh, a whole lot to get to where they are, and uh, it's not something that uh, is easily attainable. But it's certainly possible, it's certainly possible. I'm not trying to discourage anybody, but I also want to make all of the people that uh, think that it's like a one, two, three, you know, if you learn for three, four, five, six years, you're already Talmud Chacham, you could uh, already Paskin al or something. No, it's not, uh, it's not quite. You could be learned enough to give a shiur Torah without being a Talmud Chacham. Uh, but to be Talmud Chacham is it's a category of its own. It's a category of its own. It's, uh, it's very different. Um, let's see. I'm intentionally not answering the reading to Elim at night question just because I have a short clip about it and I would like for you to watch it and other people to watch it as well. It's a, it's a common question. I want people to watch the clip. So you could share it with other people also. Let's see. Uh, any other questions? Or do we do everything, Bo Hashem, already? Okay, no more from there. Uh, 
Okay, Baruch Hashem, we've answered all the questions. Thank you very much for learning with me. Kadosh Baruch Hu bless you. With bracha, atzlacha, ma'asim tovim. And uh, Bezot Hashem, everybody continues to learn Torah, do mitzvot. Uh, as I said, anyone that wants the tefillin, whether it's Rabbeinu Tam or Rashi tefillin, or Ashkenazi tefillin, Sephardi tefillin, we have them finally, Baruch Hashem, on our site. You could order them there. Uh, you could contact me if you have questions or something like that. But don't be one of these annoying people that just ask questions to shop around. I don't have that kind of time. Um, uh, if you really are serious, I'll help you. But uh, if you're just one of these people that just like to ask questions for entertainment purposes, please don't ask. Um, be, uh, be merciful on my time. Um, at some point, I also need to learn. One day I want to be a Tomit Chacham when I, when I grow up. Uh, so uh, please... If you can ask questions, ask questions that matter to you. And this uh, also, oh, uh, there's a big surprise. Be'ezrat Hashem, Be'ezrat Hashem. Big surprise coming for, uh, to all of our very dear students, subscribers, uh, fans, whoever, that uh, likes to know what's, uh, what we've taught, what we think, uh, and uh, have it easily accessible to them. Very, very big surprise, Be'ezrat Hashem, coming very, very soon. If you pray hard enough, maybe perhaps your merit is going to make it come sooner than you uh, can imagine. But this is something in my unbelievable, unbelievable, and it's uh, Be'ezrat Hashem going to come very soon. Okay, Bochav HaZlacha, Kol Tuv to everyone. Uh, anyone that wants to donate, go to the website, donate on Be'ezrat Hashem.org, Torah. Or if you want to do a tikkun, we only have a couple of weeks left. Tikkun abrit. Uh, and all the other stuff that I said, but most importantly, learn Torah, do mitzvot, be like Yitro. Kol tu b'chabat Hokanos asked him, what can we do to protect ourselves from Chavrei Mashiach? He says, Torah and Gmilut Chasadim. Even if somebody does a, a nice thing or learns a lot or anything like that, it's never compared to bringing one of Hashem's lost kids that's been lost for the last 3,000 years back home. One of the beautiful things that we have in our organization is that we have both Torah and Zikui Arabi because we have our Kolels, we have our Avrachim, and we also have our Kiruv that we do around the world. Our lectures reach every corner of the world, Baruch Hashem, in multiple languages, but of course, we always want to do even more. יכול להיות שעכשיו אנחנו נשמע את השופעה של המשיח. נמצא איתנו כאן האורח מפלורידה, יושב ראש הארגון, מזכה הרבים, הרב ירון ראובן. בעזרת השם כולנו נעשה ונצליח ונגדל בתורה ונזכה את הרבים ונעשה כבוד שמיים כמו שצריך. עבדתם המלאה תורה, תמשיכו, תהיו אור גדול. שמה ישראל, אדוני אלוהים, אדוני... בהזדמנות אני מברך את הרב ירון ראובן שהוא זקן ערבי ומחזיק תורה בעם ישראל בארץ וגם בתפוצות אשרי אמר שחר כהו שימשיך עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה זכות גדולה מאוד שהוא מחזיק תורה בעם ישראל טוב, ש"סים נוספו הערב לעם ישראל לכבודה של תורה, להרמת קרנה של תורה וכל הדברים הללו ברוך השם הודות לידידנו יושב ראש הארגון שעוד לא ידע את ההפתעה שתכננתי לו while we have Kiruv work that we've done throughout the whole year, we also have the Torah that we're constantly producing more and more of, and last but not least, the uh, Chesed to feed the poor people in Israel. A very special thank you to all our amazing guests who show real about this land by taking the time out of their busy schedule and sharing their ups and downs with us, all for the sake of our Israel. The Yirgun Be'ezrat Hashem will be able to collect a lot of salam 
בכל רחבי הארץ. One of the big things that we have, aside from this campaign, you probably see this poster or something similar to it, is also we published some of the recent results that we have, or at least up to now, of the organization. And one of the reasons why we do this each year is because we want to make sure that our partners, our donors, our Talmidim, know where their money is going. Unlike everybody else that, you know, uh, says a lot, does a lot, we want to show you what these results are. I can tell you from my experience and a little bit of knowledge about the whole Torah world, I don't know of anybody else, uh, any other organization on planet Earth that produces dollar for dollar what we've produced over these last few years. This is nothing to be arrogant about. It's simply Siyat Bishmaya HaKadosh Baruch who helped us. We made every sacrifice that we can possibly make in order to, to make it happen. Producing nearly 300 films, publishing 32 books, our own books, giving out 154,000 books for free. Giving out 154,000 books is not a cheap endeavor. Anyone that wants to do such a thing has to be completely committed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to his children, and most importantly, to have bitachon in HaKadosh Baruch Hu and his Torah. We also have fed over 160,000 people over these last several years. Each year during Pesach, the high holidays, throughout the year, we help a lot of people eat, help make sure that they have groceries, food, all types of things. And uh, you guys have seen many of the videos that are uh, that we've produced over the years to actually show you the people that are getting this food. You have here 160,000 people have eaten, nearly 300 Torah films. And then on top of all of it, we have 1.4 million USB CDs and cards that have been given out for free. All of the work that we've done over the last 10 years on these USBs given out for free. Last but not least, 12,000 video and audio lectures available online in about 14 different languages for the world to watch for free. <laughs> ארגון בעזרת השם לקח על עצמו את אחת המטרות הקשות ביותר בדור שלנו לתקן עולם במלכות שדי לא להסתפק במשהו אחד לעזור רק לאנשים מסכנים רק לאנשים ניצולי שואה רק לאנשים שלא מכירים את אלוקים רק לאנשים שאין להם כלום בבית אלא לעזור לכלל ישראל בכל מכל ברוך השם, חפץ השם בידינו הצליח למעלה ממיליון יהודים ויהודיות נעזרו על ידי ארגונים בעזרת השם. רק תדמיינו לכם איזה עוצמה היה לכל אחד ואחת מהשותפים שזכו להיות כל אחד כפי כוחו ויכולתו, לאיזה תוצאות הצליחו להגיע ולאיזה תוצאות עוד יצליחו. ברוך הוא שמח על לראות את השלטים, נעלה עכשיו למעלה, כמו קצת האש, את הלימוד. ברוכים הבאים, אפשר לראות כאן. כולם יושבים לומדים, איזה רעש של תורה, איזה רעש, איזה רעש, והנה יש פה עוד בית מדרש. וגם פה יש, השם הכל עמוס. דמיון הזה הוא לא דמיון כל כך רחוק כי כמו שהתורה אומרת בפיך ובלבבך לעשותו ככה גם בדבר הזה כל מי שירצה, כל מי שרוצה או רוצה להיות שותפים איתנו, עם הארגון הקדוש והנפלא הזה, שכל כוונתו לשם שמיים, להגדיל תורה ולהדירה, להרים קרן התורה, לעזור לכל אחד ואחד מעם ישראל, בכל העניינים, כל המישורים, מהילד הכי קטן, שצריך מטרנה וטיטולים, עד האיש הכי 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 מבוגר, שלעולם לא הניח תפילין, ורגע לפני המוות דואגים להניח לו תפילין. אם גם אתם רוצים להיות שותפים בכאלה דברים גדולים, בעשייה של תורה ועבודה וגמילות חסדים, ברוך השם, ארגון בעזרת השם, כאן. לצדכם, לשירותכם, יחד עם כלל ישראל. כמעט מיליון וחצי דיסקים, דיסקונקים, שחילקנו, כל הדברים האלה בחינם, יותר מ-12 אלף שיעורים, אז כל הדברים האלה, מתי שבן אדם רואה כמה ההשקעה שלו, אם זה בבתים, מניות, בכל מיני דברים, והוא רואה שהמניה עלתה 10% במקום אחד, ו-1,000% במקום שני, אז הוא מבין איפה להשקיע פעם הבאה. ואותו דבר פה, יש הרבה אנשים שברוך השם צופים את השיעורים שלנו, שיעורים של הרב אפרים, שיעורים של הרב שרביט, ושאר הרבנים בארגון, ועכשיו זה הזמן להיות שותפים בדבר הגדול שאנחנו עושים, ברוך השם. One of the reasons why we do this, why we show these numbers, is because we want to show everyone what we've done to give you an indication. An indication of what we can do 
in the future. So this is the time where we need as much of your help as possible to push yourself more than you typically do. If you typically donate a couple hundred dollars, donate a thousand. If you, uh, if you could afford uh, the uh, uh, 8,000, 15,000, 50,000, whatever you could afford, this is the time to do it because this is going to be the help that we have to help all of these Avachim, to feed these people and perhaps Bezal Hashem one day to get that building that we've been uh, wanting to, uh, to build here in, uh, in the United States to build a community. But the, all of these things require millions of dollars. If not now, then when? 